I hope you guys are ready for your once a year uh, so-called podcast, because this is not really a podcast. I know podcasts are supposed to be done every week or every other week or once a month, and I don't know what I'm doing, but we're just going to roll with it. We are rolling with it. So today I felt inspired to make a podcast episode, first of all, because I had nothing better to do. But second of all, because I wanted to discuss something that I noticed I was starting to develop an interest in, and that was just uh, something called qualia. Uh, Actually, I don't know if it's pronounced qualia or maybe qualia because of quality. Um, I pronounce it as qualia. Uh, I don't know how Wikipedia thinks it's supposed to be nouns. Okay, I think it is qualia. Okay, Uh, so I guess I should say qualia. So, um, for those that don't know, or for those who aren't into, like, esoteric blah 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 and I didn't know what this was until maybe, like, a week or two ago, um, uh, qualia is basically the subjective and conscious experience you have, and it's only as I just said, your subjective experience of something. So, with qualia, the best definition I can give, if this sounds kind of nebulous and weird, is an, a quote from Love the Way You Lie by Eminem and Rihanna. And again, this is as far as I understand qualia. I'm obviously not an expert, I'm just a goober, but in that song, the first line that Eminem says is, I can't tell you what it really is, I can only tell you what it feels like. And that's basically what qualia is. It's just your subjective experience of something. So how red is that color red? What does it taste like? Something like that. And nobody else can feel it but you. I guess the probably the best example I can give of a physical sensation in my mind is maybe pain. Because nobody else can feel your own physical pain. So that's as um, good of a definition and as good of an example I can give to you. But the other piece of information I wanted to talk about today, the other um, concept, is the uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, also known as the HPA axis, which is much simpler to say, so I will probably refer to it as that for the duration of this episode. And the HPA axis are influences and feedback loops in the brain that cause what we would consider to be a heightened state of awareness in the body. So this is the fight or flight response, the stress response. This is when your heart starts beating, you start sweating, and you feel like you're going to do do your pants, essentially. So Generally, this is a negative feedback loop, and if you don't know what a negative feedback loop is in contrast to a positive feedback loop, a negative feedback loop means that eventually the stimulus has to kind of stop. So, for example, if, you know, the hypothalamus is releasing corticotropin releasing hormone, or CRH, the pituitary then releases... Um, ACTH, and then we get cortisol from the adrenal cortex. Eventually, when the stimuli is not present anymore, uh, let's say you see like a spider and you're like, oh my god, I am going to have diarrhea, that's going to start that HPA axis. Even though, again, the spider is not dangerous to you and your person, it still scares you. In that case, after the spider leaves, the feedback is supposed to stop. The negative feedback stops and uh, no more hormones are released. 
However, positive feedback means that essentially it doesn't stop. So I guess the kind of classic feed, positive feedback loop that comes to my mind is just giving birth. Uh, think about it this way. Unless the baby stops being <laughs> alive, uh, you're not going to stop having contractions once you start having contractions. Like the oxytocin is still going to be released. The baby is going to... Con you're going to continue having contractions until the baby is born. And then afterwards, that's it. But with this... Um, generally with this stress response, you're not supposed to constantly be in a state of elevation, physical or mental elevation. Now, I, I don't want anybody here who is listening to this to get confused with a, a pseudoscientific concept, which is called adrenal fatigue I think that's what it's called it could also go by words like adrenal burnout adrenal exhaustion something like that because unless you have some kind of I don't even know like if you have Addison's disease basically that's just saying you have Addison's disease um, and if that's the case that's something completely different but not everybody who is experiencing emotional burnout or physical disability in that way where they might feel very fatigued or say, for example, somebody who has fibromyalgia. They're not experiencing the fatigue of adrenal fatigue, uh, the phenomenon of adrenal fatigue. Adrenal fatigue is a pseudoscientific concept where basically it, a lot of times it will boil down to your root chakra's energy being depleted to the point where um, you no longer have like instinctual driver energy or motivation to do anything, thus experiencing burnout. Now, I'm not here to dog on the spiritual community. I really am not. I like to um, learn about chakras. I have learned about them. I think they are very interesting. But I don't want to mix those two. And then this is also not to dog on anybody who also practices Ayurveda. Uh, this is just saying these are not the same things. And frankly, I think adrenal fatigue is misattributed. So that's not what I'm talking about today. But anyway, how does qualia and the HPA axis relate? I think another characteristically subjective experience that a lot of people are um, going through right now, maybe more so than ever, if, you know, people writing about the United States of Xanax <laughs> uh, can give us any indication, as anxiety. And anxiety, for anybody who's ever experienced, I mean, everybody's, let's not beat around the bush, Everybody has experienced anxiety at some point. But people who live with, for example, GAD or panic disorder or people who have OCD, you know, um, even people who have OCPD, anything um, that is like your anxiety is a part of you, you experience it every day, uh, it's um, life altering, let's say. For people who experience chronic anxiety, they can't convey to you how that feels. Unless you've experienced anxiety attacks or if you've experienced um, significantly disruptive anxiety producing events, you really can't describe that to someone else. So that is qualia in some certain term. Think about it this way. How do you describe your conscious subjective experience with anxiety? We can describe the physical manifestations, uh, sweating, shaking, um, breathing very quickly, very hard, but nobody can ever kind of slot you into their body when that's happening and say, feel my anxiety. It just doesn't happen. Same thing with pain. If you have a toothache, you can describe what a toothache feels like, but until the person has it themselves, you're just describing your in-the-moment, unique 
uh, conscious experience with it. So that's why with um, with qualia, um, we need to use it, and I think it can be used to understand and relate to people who have anxiety, who have this kind of overactive HPA axis. I should probably describe what each of these do. So the hypothalamus, which is the H part of the HPA axis, uh, controls a lot of things. So the hypothalamus, um, digestion, uh, thirst, uh, hunger, even um, like mood, sexual activity, anything like that. The pituitary gland um, secretes a lot of hormones from the hypothalamus. That's why when you uh, the hypothalamus releases CRH, which is corticotropin releasing hormone, the anterior pituitary will release just X hormone. So for example, it will release um, adrenocorticotropic hormone, which is ACTH, not to be confused with ADH, that's something else. So the anterior pituitary is kind of, and the I guess I should say the posterior, are kind of just holding tanks for uh, certain hormones that also influence digestion, mood, sex, hunger, thirst, whatever. And the adrenal cortex has different types of hormones, but for our purpose, we're mostly focusing um, on the um, corticosteroids. So this is the ones that get you going. So these are the ones that raise your blood pressure. They raise your blood sugar. These are the ones that will make your heart beat faster. Kind of like, like catecholamines, essentially. So these are the go-go-go ones. Just from my description of these hormones, you can kind of see what we're approaching here. So think about it this way. If you are constantly being overstimulated by this axis for whatever reason, uh, say, let's say that you, li you have a precarious living situation, or let's say you don't meet your money at the, you know, you don't meet your rent at the end of the month because you don't have money. Uh, let's say it's because you are um, in a, an abusive relationship. Let's say you've recently lost something. You've recently lost a child. Anything like this. Even something like going through a natural disaster. If this system is not turned off, let's say a negative feedback loop continues and continues and continues without end. This is essentially why physiologically people can't turn off their anxiety because you can't stop hormones from being released. You can't stop your body from going into fight or flight mode, no matter how hard you try. You can modulate this, for example, with certain hormones. Um, GABA is a big one here. Uh, GABAergic medications, there aren't a lot of them, which is kind of why a lot of people who do have anxiety that don't have a lot of inhibitory hormones being released if that is the problem but if they don't have a lot of inhibitory hormones being released this happens to them um they're consistently elevated can't relax very nervous uh, can't sleep so let's say how does how does um how does qualia relate to this I think about it as this, if we were more adept in understanding subjectivity and accepting that some things can't and shouldn't be um, generalized into kind of our greater collective, we would understand and have more of an appreciation for the individual's subjective experience and try to stop... Um, maybe being dismissive of people with anxiety, people with chronic pain and saying, you know, uh, you obviously saying, well, it can't be that bad or, you know, 
I, you know, I don't know. I, I can't understand that. I don't know what it feels like. Whatever, whatever. Because um, qualia is very important in understanding body sensations, your perceptual experiences. I think we need to be okay with not understanding that people feel things in the moment that we can't feel. People feel very uh, left out, isolated, unsure, and sometimes even angry when they don't feel like they, they themselves can comprehend one-on-one -on -one what somebody is feeling. A lot of times they feel frustrated like, I, you know, I can't relate to you because I'm not in your body or I'm not in your head. And that's, I understand that frustration, but I also think there's almost this um, isolating feeling that comes along with it for people who do have anxiety, who do have chronic pain, or just straight up experience perceptual phenomenon that a lot of people don't. I also assume this must be probably isolating for people who have synesthesia, for example, because it's unfamiliar. And it's always said that humans don't like things that are unfamiliar. And in this case, you know, I accept that. So some people straight up just don't think um, qualia is real. Philosophers kind of vacillate on this from what I can tell. Some deny that it exists. Some uh, can empathize with it. It's kind of like what Hunter Thompson said about the edge. The only people who know about it are those who have been over it. Um... Neuroscientists and neurologists, a lot of them are kind of split on it, but I do think a lot of them in a certain way from studying the brain do believe that um, qualia exist. And some people are just going to say, well, that's not scientific. You know, somebody having anxiety, how do we know they really are having anxiety if we can't measure it? And we measure it based on what we can see. If we see somebody's pacing very nervously, can't breathe, heart fluttering, or they, um, you know, you can measure muscle tension. These are all things that we can say, okay, somebody's clearly not okay right now. Maybe they're having a panic attack. But I, I think we need to appreciate that the HPA axis which can show us objectively what is going on within a person, say if they have chronic fatigue, if they're not sleeping well, burnout, constant stress, that can show us with evidence to a certain extent, yeah, oh, you have high cortisol levels, you're experiencing cortisol dumping, that's not a scientific term, but <laughs> you get what I mean. These are things that are Objective, you can even tell if somebody's immune system is compromised. We know chronic stress weakens the immune system. But we don't have an appreciation for these things. And there is a lot of maybe doubt, even nowadays with greater acceptance towards mental health, that people aren't straight up just making things up. Or they're not just trying to get people to, quote, buy in unquote into their subjective reality now i like to believe people when they say they're experiencing things like this even if they don't show physical symptoms but i understand for a lot of people if you can't if you can't um codify it in something it's not something you can register and that's fine but we also have to understand that our society likes to kind of play down um, the HPA axis's importance and say, you know, this is not that it's all in your head, but, you know, this is just something you have to go through. Everybody goes through this. Everybody hates their job. Everybody doesn't like Mondays. Everybody doesn't get enough sleep or blah, blah, blah. You're not special. And just because you're not special doesn't mean that that's an answer. If you are, you know, some people talk about making yourself sick. And the compassion that we see extended towards people who um, need to kind of check out of situations because they're unwell is not very high. There is, you know, we can describe... Um, 
qualia in many different ways is very, you know, private. It's intrinsic to the person. It, it doesn't change on other people's experiences, their relation to the experience. It can't be communicated. So, of course, people are going to say, well, where's my evidence for this? And you have to say, well, there isn't any. I can't tell you what it really is. I can only tell you what it feels like. Um, you can make an analogy like water is wet, but that's qualia or qualia. See, now I'm lapsing. <laughs> it's perceptual awareness. And I actually kind of wonder if this is what people on, you know, the dead ethels, I guess, let's say, if this is what the dead ethels are experiencing, if they're just experiencing this type of um, qualia and we just don't know about it. If people who are on the phetamines and the nootropics, nootropics, the word is weird, they are experiencing something very personal that you can't convey to other people. And it's weird when you start talking about your DMT entities, you're like, you know, my gate guardian has 15 hands, is purple, and lives on a cloud. People are going to be like, that's weird. <laughs> But maybe that's the only way you can express that to people, and there isn't any other way. It's very raw, you know, it's very raw. Um, so, I guess how I, you know... How I want to see um, qualia be used is in a more research-based way because I know people like research. So I found a few articles here and one of them is completely just, I don't even know why they called it this because it's very <laughs> clunky. But the study is looking for effects of qualia on event-related Brain potentials of close others in search for a cause of the similarity of qualia assumed across individuals. That is a mouthful. Frankly, um, Sheila needs to retitle that. Irregardless of it, I think that this is a worthy subject matter to explore. And I would especially like to see it used more in experiences of pain, of anxiety. But of course, people are going to say, why am I funding something that we can't get objective answers from? If you can only tell somebody what it feels like, how and why and what's the point? Some people might think that. That's why qualia is philosophical in nature. Nobody can really prove it. Nobody can prove that you feel anything. You can't prove you feel anything. If it's intangible, well, what are you going to do? Pull it out of your skin and give it form? Of course, you're not God. <laughs> but. I just think that we need to start asking, what's it like to be? What's it like to be scared? What's it like to be afraid? Because we try to ask people to describe it. Why? What is it? And sometimes you just need to let somebody kind of express as close as they can what something is like from their point of view. And I mean not point of view as in what they think about it. Literally how it feels to be, to feel to experience XYZ. It's impossible though. I know this is kind of like an impossible task to give somebody, but trying to understand what it feels like to feel nauseous when you're having a panic attack, how it feels to feel crampy and in pain and fatigued and like you can't move, how it feels to feel like your nerve endings are on fire for somebody, let's say, that has like, I don't even know, diabetic neuropathy or trigeminal neuralgia. Now I'm just throwing out terms that most of the people listening to this are going to be like, that sounds weird. Sounds like you made it up. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. 
And most of the people you're going to have to talk to for this are going to be people who are tired. They're tired of trying to tell people what it feels like, what it looks like, how it occurs, why they feel that way. They're di- they're tired. They're tired of it. I mean, you know, trying to ask somebody who has rheumatoid arthritis what it feels like when their joints are set on fire, you know, they would probably be like, why would I even tell you? You don't have rheumatoid arthritis. But we need to be open to people giving to us their qualia and their HPA axis experiences. Um, I found another article entitled Assessment of Qualia and Effect in Urban and Natural Soundscapes. So I guess this one is trying to ascertain what sounds make an environment and what, you know, the perception of your environment, how it affects a person's affect, you know, and their affect. Does hectic urban um, soundscape, how does that affect somebody and their subjective experience of that on the inside versus a natural soundscape? You know, and I guess this also will vary on geography and how a person uh if we're doing sociologically how have they been conditioned to understand what is rural and what is urban you know some people think new york city is urban some people think i don't even know what's like a tiny i was gonna say what's a tinier city than new york city but like most cities are tinier than that Some people think the city with uh, 30,000 people is a big city that's 15 minutes away from them. That's the big city. That's urban. Some people think nature is um, exclusively just the wilderness. Some people think nature is my backyard. (laughs) So it all depends. And then I found something Deepak Chopra wrote about, which, I mean, you know, Obviously, I'm not using Deepak Chopra as, like, the be-all, end-all of intellectual, um, (laughs) he's not an intellectual king, but the foundation for a science of consciousness is he applies the qualia principle to, you know, create a basis for the science of consciousness, and you may be asking yourself, can we even do that? Is that a thing that we can do? Yeah, that's basically what neuroscience, neuroscientists try to do in some certain terms is, or neuro, you know, some psychologists try to establish a science of consciousness, even though, again, consciousness is completely subjective. The problem here is, is that a lot of people think that science is only worthy if it is completely objective. I don't agree with that. I think that science should focus both on the subjective and the objective. And some people might think that that breaks the whole fabric of science. I don't. Because would it not be valuable to take into consideration the the qualia of something like anxiety, something like bipolar, something like um, IBS, something like BPD, post-traumatic stress disorder, because these offer us value insights that can't be found in just saying, well, you have a lot of, or let's say you have a deficiency of serotonin, which nobody would know that, but they just assume it. They assume that these characteristics are because you don't have enough serotonin or you don't have enough dopamine. We assume that these things are true, even though God knows Nobody can measure how much serotonin you have in your body. I don't think they can. I don't know. I don't know of anything that does test for that. I would find it valuable to see maybe um, what is someone's qualia of their depression. Maybe we can try and create new research around that, focusing on uh, how antidepressants can, um, let's say if your qualia of depression is you feel that your feet are made of lead, 
how can we make an antidepressant that would somehow connect the physical experience of that to the emotional experience of how that person feels it that's what i think would be cool because most of these people can't down regulate there they have just too much cortisol from chronic stress and you know, some people, even this is like a, um, like a sex hormone problem. Um, for example, women post, or let's say during menopause, have a lot of emotional dysregulation. Um, people, women that are still menstruating, PMS, that's a thing. And you can't say, well, I don't, know how to tell you about my craving for chocolate how how can one describe crave crave is subjective you can't uh quantify this in a number crave is not a number but the qualia of it matters and i think we can really kind of modulate um how we fundamentally think about even something as large as social interactions through qualia. How do people with social anxiety, what is their qualia around social interaction? I guess I'll close this out by saying that this isn't the only system in the body that regulates stress, that regulates fight, flight, freeze, fawn. I think there's like four. <laughs> there's four Fs. Um, this isn't the only thing that makes you feel heightened. But... This is a problem for a lot of people and they don't know why. They say, am I just too type A? Am I broken? Is there, is my brain not wired correctly? Is this something only I experience? Or that if not just me, if only me and my weirdos experience? No, it's sometimes it's, like I said, just a part of your uh it's just your sex hormones which for some people that is very dysphoria inducing i assume for a trans person who is trying to transition let's say from male to female and they have to now take estrogen estrogen gives you a quality of feelings you thus far have not maybe been able to experience with such death what is the qualia of um a lot of estrogen in your body feelings of perhaps very great deep and tender melancholy you know as as the female hysteria community on tumblr would say people who have thyroid issues you know that can mimic these types of experiences people who have hyperthyroidism they constantly feel like they're on a live wire like they're on a bender they had to feel like they had too many phetamines in the morning with their coffee and people with hypothyroidism their qualia is feeling just blah like sluggish tired burnt out you know on the under and the other edge and that is a major component a lot of these uh feelings of qualia are major components towards diagnosing something if somebody says yeah, I just feel ten to quote the quote talking hens, tense and nervous and I can't relax. That could be an indication of anxiety, hypothyroidism. I, I'm sorry, hyperthyroidism. So are antidepressants effective? Do they tell do they can you do they increase somebody's qualia? Well no, that's not what they're for. But you know, maybe sometimes people are describing things that physicians mistakenly believe are the qualia associated with depression but really they have no words for what they're feeling and they're just pulling from something that is closely related to that you know 
And I don't even, I don't want to dismiss the rare cases in which, let's say, you have high cortisol levels and you're not just super stressed out. Yeah, maybe you have like a pheochromocytoma, if we're going to pull from a House MD episode. Um, you know, but <sighs> sometimes you just have MDD and you're tired. <laughs> if it's not Cushing's, sometimes you're just too freaking wired. I don't know what else to say, but we need to use the word, what is it like to be? It's, it's a problem. It's a general problem. The subjective and objective have always been a problem. And unfortunately, I think until we make advances where you can literally put your consciousness in somebody else's body, it's literally impossible. Unless you can mind meld. It's, it's the, you know, the, the problem of consciousness, I guess. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's difficult. For sure, for sure. And finally, I just want to say, like, sometimes this is based on qualia, like I was saying with urban and natural environments, this is sometimes just based on what you've experienced. So you may not have the capabilities yet to even describe what you're feeling. I've thus far kind of approached this with an understanding that people have enough even cognitive reasoning to explain what they're feeling. But so let's say you're a kid, uh, you can't, you don't have the words to describe how, let's say, um, giving birth makes you feel. The fact that someone who is pregnant when they give birth, that's a feeling that maybe thus, uh, and uh, before that point, they didn't have the words, the feeling to this, you know, the capabilities to describe it. Now they do. Some things can only be accurately known up to when you get to a certain point in life. I think another thing, if we're going to go back to, um, let's say, losing your first tooth. You don't know what it, the qualia is, the qualia to describe losing a first tooth until you lose your first tooth. <laughs> You can understand that that's a thing that happens, but maybe you cognitively are not aware of people with dementia. They may lose the ability, the cognition to describe what they feel or how they perceive something or how it affects them. That, that qualia has then been removed. And there are so many philosophers I'm sure who have explored this that I frankly <laughs> probably they they're a lot smarter than me so um I don't even think I could comprehend what they're saying I'm just a goober on the internet but point being if neuroscience can't capture the vividness of your mental and physical experience that doesn't mean that you're not having a mental visual phenomenological experience you still are it just means we haven't caught up to you to me to everybody and there is no such thing as qualia free everybody has qualia i'm sure god himself has qualia you know the blueness of the sky is different for other people for example if i describe it as being periwinkle unless we like hold up a swatch to the sky that's that's my blueness of the sky that is that's me you know the sound of an instrument is how i think a violin sounds what it evokes in me is different i think music is the place that you will find this because music touches so many people differently that's another area i'd like research to uh tap into because I don't think quality is fake. I don't think it's unstudiable. I don't think it is stupid. <laughs> I think it's really cool. And just because there's a veil over our perceptual field doesn't mean that there is no explanation for it. It's unanswered for now. 
but hopefully maybe with something like AI advances in technology, we can, we can understand it. That would be beautiful. Until then, guys, keep it real. Keep feeling all your feelings. Keep feeling all the senses. Uh, keep buying into the mystery of life and just roll with it.